Hi guys, uh, today we're going to do the uh, water resources notes for our water unit. And the first concept we're going to start with is just the idea that uh, water on this planet is uh, very abundant, but usable water is very, very rare. And we're going to see several diagrams that kind of show us the same idea over and over again. So something we need to realize is that uh, most water on the planet is salt water found in the oceans and less than 3% of all water on the planet is fresh water. And then if we break down the 3% of fresh water that we have on the planet, uh, most of that is tied up as ice uh, and glaciers. So over 77% of that. 22% uh, is found uh, below ground water. And then we have uh, very small percentages that are found in actual like surface bodies of water and atmospheric water. And so I have, just have a bunch of the same uh, general diagrams over and over again. So again, here we're seeing uh, most water on the planet is salt water in oceans. 3% is fresh water. Of that, most of it's ice caps and glaciers. 30% uh, of that's groundwater. Um, now, of the surface water here, it says 0.3% of surface water. Here it breaks down the surface water. Uh, most of surface water is found in lakes and then swamps and then rivers. <coughs> All right, and then this is all the same stuff over and over again, but I, th I liked this little diagram down here at the bottom that I want to show you. So this is um, showing if we have 100 liters of uh, water representing all of Earth's water, um, only 3 liters of that would be fresh water. And of those 3 liters of fresh water, only half a teaspoon would actually be readily available fresh water that um, we as humans can actually use. So very, very, very small percentage of Earth's water is actually usable by humans. We're actually able to access it and use it as fresh water for drinking and our other uses. Okay, so let's talk some more about groundwater. And I have a good diagram that shows all this stuff. Um, so water that's found underground, we call it groundwater. It exists in aquifers. Uh, and it says that those are small spaces found within permeable layers of rock and sediment where water is found. So permeable, if we remember from our soil stuff, means that water can move through it. <clears throat> so you have two different types of aquifers. We have unconfined aquifers, um, which says that uh, you've got this porous rock that's covered by soil and water can flow in and out. So that's going to be the type of aquifer that we find like right underground. Water is going to, you know, come down in the form of precipitation. It's going to be able to move through the ground. That's called an unconfined aquifer. And then we've got these confined aquifers that are usually deeper down and they are surrounded by a layer of impermeable rock or clay. Um, now when we learned about soil, we learned clay does not allow water to move through it very well because the clay part are very small and they're very tightly compacted. Um, so impermeable means that it's basically going to serve as a cap and it's not going to allow water to move through it. And that's what this says here. It impedes water's ability to flow in and out. <clears throat> uh, so let me just show you that. So this is showing a nice little house and here's your ground. And so again, if imagine you have some precipitation uh, that's hitting the ground and you've got water that's going to be able to percolate into the soil. That's going to come here and it's going to become part of the unconfined aquifer, which is just that groundwater right underground. Um, we're getting ready to learn about the word uh, water table and we'll learn about wells here in a moment as well. Here's this impermeable layer I was talking about. Uh, if you have uh, groundwater underneath of that impermeable layer, we call that a confined aquifer. And so your confined and your unconfined aquifers are going to make different types of wells. Okay, so we saw that term water table. What the water table is, it says it's the uppermost level at which the water in an area fully saturates the rock or the soil, and it, we consider it the surface, the highest point of the groundwater. Uh, to recharge is to input more water uh, by way of percolating or infiltration, um, water seeping into the soil and down into the aquifer. And here it's telling us that those unconfined aquifers um, don't allow percolation. Oh, that should actually be confined. Yeah, I believe that should actually be confined because they don't allow percolation, so they will not be able to be recharged. <clears throat> and then a spring would be considered um, water that actually flows up from an aquifer naturally. It percolates up to the surface of the water, and you get this fresh filtered water that's been filtered by the soil um, coming out of the ground. And so these are your natural springs, and that's a picture of one. 
Okay. Now let's talk about wells. A uh, long time ago, humans figured out that water could be obtained from aquifers by just digging a hole in the ground. So digging a hole in the ground to access water, that's considered a well. Uh, most, wa most modern wells do contain pumps. Um, but you can actually create natural wells because uh, when you're dealing with those confined aquifers, the ones that are under that impermeable rock layer, uh, so there's a natural pressure built up in those deep um, water wells. So drilling a hole would be enough to move the water up on its own, and this is called an artesian well. And we talked about recharging. Recharging is the infiltration of water down into these aquifers. Um, recharge rates vary, uh, so it says it's important to make sure that withdrawal rates do not exceed the recharge rates. If you're withdrawing water faster than you're, you're, letting, you're allowing it to recharge, uh, the well is going to run dry. <clears throat> I just want to show you these wells real quick. So here's a well where you'd have to have a pump because uh, this is in your unconfined aquifer, so there's no pressure there. You'd have to pump the water out from under the ground. And then here is your uh, confined aquifer that has pressure built up in it. If you dig down through this impermeable layer, they say that there's enough natural pressure that it would flow up on its own, and that's called an artesian well. Okay, so a, an important case study on aquifers, uh, we've already mentioned this before when we talked about um, oil and tar sands, we mentioned the uh, Keystone Pipeline, so I'm going to show you that again here in a second. Uh, but the Ogallala Aquifer, we should all know that and remember this name, um, it's a very current issue in terms of our country and oil and energy and also with, uh, with water. Um, so the Ogallala aquifer is the largest aquifer in the U.S. It's located out in the Great Plains, and I'll show you a picture on the next slide. Um, it says, large amounts of water have been withdrawn for the following uses. Uh, lots of households in that area, lots of farms and agriculture and industry. It's got a really, really slow recharge rate, so it's not keeping pace with all of the withdrawals that are happening for these various reasons. And so we're really worried that the Great Plains um, could run out of water this century because of these really, really fast withdrawal rates. And we'll talk about ways to conserve water later on in this unit. Uh, so anyways, I wanted to show you where this Ogallala Aquifer is. Uh, as we said, it's out here in the Midwest. And um, you can see the states that it runs through, the Dakotas, Wyoming, Colorado, uh, Kansas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. Now, something I wanted to add on to this is this whole Keystone XL pipeline drama. Um, if we look down here at this key, this blue dotted line right here, this is the, where the existing Keystone Pipeline is. And then these red lines are where they are proposing to add on. And that's something that's being discussed now. You probably have seen commercials on TV about it to either support it or don't support it. Um, you know, it's up to Obama to decide uh, if he wants this project to go through or not, if he wants to sign off on it. Um, I was just reading an article that said even if he doesn't sign off on the pipeline, they're probably still going to be mining the tar sands in Canada and just sending them via railroad anyway. So <clears throat> some people actually think this pipeline is a safer way to do it. Anyways, the drama with uh, the aquifer here is that a lot of people are worried, okay, you've got this pipeline carrying crude oil right over top of our country's largest aquifer. What if there's a leak um, and it just happens to leak oil into this aquifer and then it gets into uh, this very important supply of water? And they say the soil that's here is very, it can get dry and sandy and absorb that oil um, really quickly. So a lot of people are worried about that in terms of the aquifer. And apparently there's a lot of important uh, ecosystems and wildlife um, habitats that are, exist in this area too. So there's a lot of people against this for those reasons. And then in terms of the energy stuff, uh, you know, people just don't want pipelines going in their backyards. Uh, people are worried that, you know, we're digging up more oil, and this is one of those unconventional methods where we have to do a lot of processing and really refine that oil before we can use it. So they're worrying that all this energy and processing is going to add to global warming. Um, we're adding to pollution issues by um, extracting more oil. Uh, we're doing destruction of ecosystems. Some people are saying we already have enough oil that we're importing from Canada and that we are making domestically as well. Um, arguments for this pipeline are that it would create more jobs, but some people say that those jobs would just be temporary construction jobs. It only last a couple of years until the project's done. Um, and some people support it because they say it'll increase our oil supply and our uh, 
increase our independence from uh, importing oil from the Middle East. So, you know, it's back and forth, back and forth. Everybody's got different opinions about it, but basically it would transport oil all the way down here to Texas and Louisiana uh, to refineries down here. Okay, and then there's just a kind of a zoomed out shot of this aquifer. So that's an important one to know. Okay, a little bit more on groundwater. Um, so we've got an issue that we can have. It's called a cone of depression. Uh, it says this is an area where there is no longer any groundwater, and that would happen due to rapid pumping of a deep well uh, that can cause adjacent shallower wells to go dry. So this is what the water table would look like when you've got several um, homes and facilities pumping water uh, before heavy pumping. Okay, everybody's got got their water. They, they both have shallower wells. This well goes pretty deep. Um, when we come over here, it shows after heavy pumping, let's say this farm is using up lots and lots of water, which we're going to learn farms do use huge amounts of water. Um, these poor guys over here, their wells don't run deep enough, uh, so you know they're out of luck. They are unable to pump water anymore, and this is the only one that's able to get it. So this water table becomes lowered uh, here, and then we call that the cone of depression. Okay. Uh, another issue you can have when pumping groundwater is called saltwater intrusion, and this would happen on, on a coastal area where you have fresh and saltwater meeting together. Uh, so this is what it would ordinarily look like at the coast. You'd have your freshwater groundwater, but then again, if you're uh, on a coastal area, you're going to eventually meet up with saltwater. You've got this little zone where we've got that separation. We've got saltwater groundwater here, and then you've got freshwater groundwater under land. Um, if you are over pumping, it can actually draw up this uh, salt water, ground water, because you're sucking the soil in when, with the well. Um, and that can actually draw in salt water into your freshwater ground water, and we call that salt water intrusion. <coughs> okay. Uh, some notes on surface water. Uh, surface water would be any sort of fresh water above ground. Uh, streams, rivers, ponds, lakes, wetlands, those are all different types of surface water. Uh, where we're talking about rivers, the three largest rivers uh, would be the Amazon in South America, the Congo in Africa, and the Yangtze River in China. We're going to talk a lot about that one uh, in these notes. And it says early civilizations usually sh set up shop uh, around rivers due to easy transportation and fertile lands. And you guys have probably learned that, learned about that in all of your history classes. Types of lakes. Uh, we've got three different classifications of lakes based on their productivity levels. Uh, we've heard this term before. Uh, eutrophic means you'd have high levels of productivity. When we think of eutrophication, though, we think of a negative thing because you've got too much nitrogen and phosphorus that's causing overgrowth of algae. Um, the opposite of that, having too little nutrients, is called oligotrophic, and that's when you have low amounts of nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen, and you have low plant productivity because of that. And mesotrophic would be in the middle. That's a moderate level of productivity. Okay, um, altering the availability of water, uh, we have various ways that we can do that. Uh, okay, so the first term we're going to look at is this word levy. We've heard a lot of that uh, over the past several years, especially after the whole Hurricane Katrina incident. Uh, and what these are, it says they're enlarged banks built up on each side of a river, and they're built to prevent flooding so they can develop floodplain land for residential and commercial use. And there's a lot of controversy with that. So um, this is actually a picture of a levee that has given way. And what it is, it's just this built-up wall. It's a built-up wall of dirt here. And this one has actually broken through. This water has broken through that wall right here. And it's just, it's just this wall that's built up to keep water from flooding in. And as it says here, they've been using them to build neighborhoods, all sorts of stuff in areas that are normally considered floodplains. And so some of the issues with that um, is that if you're creating these levees, you're preventing flooding in areas, which we'd say, okay, for residential areas, that's good. But some, you know, environmentally minded people might say that, okay, Normally, that land is used to having flooding, and if you have floodwaters that can no longer add sediments um, to that land, that land is no longer going to get that same fertility level it used to get when it had a lot of flooding and a lot of sediments brought on board. So you'd have reduced fertility of land when you build these levees. Um, 
And then we'll talk about some other issues later on when we talk about floods and floodplains. But I'll just I'll mention a couple of them now since I'm looking at this. Um, you have sediments that um, they're not going to be released in floods now. They're going to flow down to the river to be emptied into the ocean, and this can end up causing worse floods downstream. And then it can also encourage building in floodplains, which is something that I just mentioned, which can actually end up becoming uh, very dangerous and unsafe. And that's basically um, what we saw happen here with Katrina. They had a false sense of security. They built these levees. They're like, okay, we're good. Then we've got this huge hurricane come through. Um, the hurricane water destroyed those levees, came in and flooded that whole area. Thousands of people died. Uh, dikes, it says it's similar to levees, but they're built to prevent ocean water from flooding adjacent land. Uh, these are po very popular in the Netherlands. Um, they used to use windmills just to pump overflow water back out to the ocean. Um, now they use these dikes, so they would look similar to this, um, but they would just be to prevent ocean water from coming in. Okay, other ways to alter the availability of water. Uh, we have dams. We all know what those are and what they look like. Here's a picture. I believe this is the Three Gorges Dam. If this isn't one, then I have another picture later, I believe, um, which is the largest dam in the world, which we'll come back and talk about here in a minute. Um, so anyways, what a dam is, it's a barrier that runs across a river or a stream, and it's going to control the flow of water for various reasons. Uh, we like to dam up water to create these reservoirs that are going to give us... Um, this nice little pool or reservoir that we can use for our consumption. We also use dams to generate electricity. We learned about that last unit with hydroelectric power. Uh, it also helps to control floods if that's an issue. We can use that reservoir water back here for recreation. And also we could say it's for aesthetic reasons. You know, now we've got this nice lake um, to use for recreational purposes, to swim in, and then it looks pretty. Okay, so that reservoir is the area where the water is stored back behind the dam back here. And then the water comes through the dam and on the other side down here. <clears throat> okay, so what are some pros of building dams? Um, they can capture and store water. The water can be released as desired. We can control the flow rates. Uh, we can decide, you know, if, if it's getting too backed up, we can allow the flow to increase. Um, you know, if we're running low on water on downstream side, we can increase the flow as well. Uh, it can control flooding downstream, okay, so we, we dam up that water, we can let the water trickle through slower. We can supply irrigation water year-round uh, through the reservoir. It can provide electricity through hydroelectric power. And recreational benefit above the dam in the reservoir, we can use that body of water for fishing, boating, all sorts of things. Okay, so this is another good picture. So here's your dam. Here's the reservoir back here. Uh, this is going to show some pros and cons. So this looks like it says large losses of water through evaporation. That would be a con. So you've got this just a sitting pool of water so you can have uh, uh, increased evaporation. It says flooded land destroys forests or croplands and displaces people. Yes, that is true. Sometimes you get flooding back here and that can cause refugees. That can cause people to have to up and leave and even wildlife as well. It uh, looks like this is a pro. Reservoir is useful for recreation and fishing. It can produce cheap electricity through hydropower. Uh, downstream flooding can be reduced. Here we see the flow has been reduced, so you've got um, a lesser chance of flooding down here. Here's a um, negative. Migration and spawning of some fish are disrupted. We'll talk about some um, fixes for that. Provides water for year-round irrigation and cropland. That's good. And then downstream cropland and estuaries are deprived of nutrient-rich silt. That's a con. So a lot of that silt and sediment can get trapped back here behind the uh, dam, and it would cause decreased nutrients uh, downstream. <coughs> Okay, so some bad things. We already looked at a lot of these. Uh, the silting behind the dam robs the downstream of nutrients. Loss of silt destroys deltas and other ecosystems. It can cause flooding behind the dam. Uh, the dams can fall apart and fall down. Uh, they disturb species like salmon that need to get back up uh, across the dam to migrate. They can cause landslides and earthquakes. And they can increase temperature and water below the dam and decrease the dissolved oxygen, which those are both bad. Okay, a couple of case studies. Um, the High Dam in Aswan, Egypt, uh, it's a dam built in the Nile River in the 1960s, and it created a lake called Lake Nassar, which uh, was bad because we had this really uh, bad increase in what we call schistosomiasis, uh, which is a disease. 
And so what happened is we created all the standing water when we dammed up the river, and that created the perfect environment for snails that transmit the schistomyosis, which is a parasite. I believe it's a protist. Um, so now we've got all the standing water. They're like, yes, this is perfect. Um, so they thrived, and they transmitted lots and lots of this uh, disease. Uh, they cannot grow in flowing water, but again, since we dammed up the water and it was the standing water, it really caused this disease to increase. That says this also happened in the Senegal River, and it could happen at Three Gorges Dam in China as well. Uh-oh. Okay, so Three Gorges Dam, I've mentioned that a couple of times now. It's the largest dam in the world. It's found in China uh, on the Yangtze River. Uh, the building of it has been controversial because it's covering ancient cities. Uh, they're worried that um, because they've disrupted the flow, that this water is actually going to expose ancient tombs and bodies coming out of the sides of these, um, I don't want to call them like cliffs, but they're just the um, banks of the river. Because they've, they've altered the flow of the river, they're worried that it's actually disrupting these ancient burial sites. Uh, also, it's displaced a whole bunch of people, over a million people, so it's caused environmental refugees. People have had to up and move. Government promised that they would help them to move and resettle after they uh, got kicked out due to the building of this dam, but they haven't really followed through very well. I have a video clip to show you guys of that. It, it's kind of disturbing, but um, so yeah. Um, also, another complaint is it's built along a fault, so it's not in a very environmentally stable place, so there's major concerns over safety of this dam. Okay, uh, now we talked about one of the issues with damming was that it will disrupt migration patterns of fish, especially salmon, so they've created these um, fixes that we call fish ladders, and so what they are, they're a set of stairs with water flowing over them, um, they've been added to some dams. They're going to help migrating fish get upstream. So these fish can actually uh, go back across the dammed up area by going through this fish ladder. Still looks like quite a journey, but they can make it. Okay, so uh, diverting water, <clears throat> meaning moving it from one place to another. Uh, that's pretty common. Um, you can do this through aqueducts. Uh, here's an aqueduct. This is one uh, coming from the Colorado River. We'll talk about that in a moment. So these are canals or ditches used to carry water from one location to another, uh, usually taking water from a lake or a river to where it is needed. So we've got some important ones in New York and Los Angeles. Um, well, these two cities, they receive water uh, via aqueducts. New York gets theirs from the Catskill, Catskill Mountains, and Los Angeles gets theirs from the Colorado River Aqueduct. So this is the Colorado River Aqueduct. Um, this is actually moving across the Mojave Desert in southwest U.S., and it's taking water from the Colorado River to Los Angeles. So that's kind of cool. Um, however, it says diverting water from the original source can be bad. A uh, perfect example of this is the Colorado River. And I'll show you this uh, on the next slide. Uh, it says, and the Rio Grande have so much water diverted from them at multiple locations that they frequently go dry. They don't run to completion. Okay, so this is a picture of Colorado River and how many dams we have on it. Um, so it looks like we start back here, and it looks like our first dam is back here uh, in Colorado near Grand Junction. Okay, and then we move on into southern Utah, northern Arizona. Here's another one. Then we come on through Arizona over here to Nevada near Vegas. I'm guessing this is probably the Hoover Dam. Uh, then we move into southern California. Another one, another one, another one. And this is where it's supposed to run to completion. And they say oftentimes it doesn't even make it. The Colorado River actually dries up before it gets to the Gulf of California. Because it's being diverted so many ways. <clears throat> okay, so some interesting case studies when we're talking about diversion. Uh, India and Bangladesh um, says that they share 250 Himalayan rivers, so uh, rivers flowing from the Himalayan mountains, from glacier melts from the Himalayan mountains. And India recently proposed a large-scale diversion project that would divert water from over 50 rivers for agricultural and household use. Okay, the problem here is that Bangladesh is downstream of this, so they're worried that their water flow will be drastically reduced if India starts damming up and diverting their water. So the question here, it says, who owns water? Can India, uh, this different country, decide, okay, since we're kind of first in line for the water, can we do as we please? Can we divert it in all these different directions? Can we dam it up? Who cares about Bangladesh, you know, if they don't end up getting that water flow? Oh, well. Um, 
Now, I've talked to some people and they say that there is legislation about that in our country. I'm not really sure what's going on over here with them, but just think about that morally and ethically. Is that like, does anybody own water? Does Bangladesh have a case? Can they come in and say, hey, we've been relying on this water for centuries and centuries. You can't just all of a sudden dam it up just because you guys encounter it first. Um, so yeah, who owns water? Can anybody own water? Um, that's an interesting question. Okay, another diversion case study is the Soviet Union versus Central Asia. This is involving the Aral Sea. Um, in the 1950s, Soviet Union diverted two rivers that fed the Aral Sea, which drastically decreased freshwater input to the sea. Uh, the following occurred. The salinity of the sea increased because it's not getting as much fresh water, which destroyed local fish populations. Uh, the surface area of the water decreased by 60%, and this actually split the sea into two different parts. You ended up having a north and a south Aral Sea. Uh, and the southern sea is predicted to completely dry out in 10 years. I'll show you a picture on the next slide. Uh, the smaller size has affected the climate in the area. It says summers are now hotter and winters are now colder. Okay. Um, so again, this is a case study of one country um, diverting water to affect an entirely different area. So here is the Aral Sea. This is back in, ooh, this is kind of blurry, but it looks like this is back in the 80s. So it used to all be one piece. And then back in 2003, now we're starting to split it into uh, different chunks here. And then you've obviously got this chunk up here. Now all you have is this little sliver, this little sliver, and then this chunk up here. This is all very salty land area that's affected the ecosystem drastically. And again, now that you're lacking this huge body of water, they said the climate in the entire area has been drastically um, different. And I think I'm going to go ahead and stop this uh, first set of notes here, and I'll do a second set of notes uh, for part two so we can break it up into two chunks. Okay, so I will see you guys soon.